Okay, I'm going to look at uh, deriving the normal distribution from first principles. Now, the normal distribution is based on uh, a curve like y is equal to e to the minus x squared. That's the basic shape of the curve. And it's worth just thinking about why that is a, why that is a useful curve for, for a statistical distribution. Uh, first of all, you notice that you know, as x goes to positive infinity or minus infinity, you basically go down to zero. So what you're saying is for for things that are a long way off from the, the middle center of the distribution, then effectively the probability is small. Similarly, around about um, around about zero, it goes up. Okay, when you put x is equal to zero here, you get one. It's also, you know, because of the x squared term, it has to be symmetric about here and here. Uh, so effectively, it's like a clustered distribution. It clusters everything around the middle. And it's just worth thinking about why why we get this sort of flat shape here, or why it goes up flat there. And that's because the derivative of the function is zero there. So it, it's going to have to go flat here. It's going to have to taper down and go to um, zero here and zero here as x goes plus or minus infinity. So if we take the derivative of that, just using the chain rules we always have done, then we take the derivative of this, which is minus x squared, which gives us minus 2x e to the minus x squared. When x is equal to 0, we get dy by dx is equal to 0. So the curve is effectively flat when x is equal to 0. Um, and we can, uh, we then want to say, okay, we don't really, it's not, obviously not going to be exactly this. We need to scale it, so maybe. Um, well, scaling is exactly what you need to do. You need to scale it in the y direction and the x direction. And also you need to consider moving it, because that would effectively move the mean. Okay? Um, so you want to think about scaling it in the x and the y direction and think about translating it. So. We put an A here to scale it in the Y direction. And then we put the B effectively by the X to get us B X squared or all B you know brackets B X close brackets squared. So when you square it out it becomes B squared X squared. Effectively this, we're replacing the X by the BX. And then once we've scaled it in the X and the Y direction, so it can be wider or it can be taller, we then want to consider translating it. Okay? Uh, so we need to find uh, a, b, and c such that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x is equal to 1, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x, f of x is equal to the mean, and th this integral, standard one for the variance, is equal to sigma squared. Okay, so that's effectively what we need to do. Um, we need to basically choose a, b, and c to be to comply with these, these uh, conditions I've written here, a, b, c here. So before we get as far as actually doing that, the first thing to find is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of these different things. And these are just useful for, for working these out. So it's useful to know e to the minus x squared dx. It's useful to know um, this. All of these things will basically uh, basically allow us to find a, b, and c and get that sort of standard formula from a book. Now the first one there's kind of a trick to. Um, so okay. Everyone knows we can't integrate directly e to the minus uh, x squared, but uh, it was a definite integral because that won't work. You, you sort of you could think about why that wouldn't work, but it's quite a common mathematical sort of thing that to know that e to the either plus or minus x squared. Well, you can't integrate that. Uh, it's a definite integral and substitute uh, plus or minus infinity in. That's not going to work. You can. It's very easy to see why that wouldn't work. Because if you assume that it could, you can, you're going to get a contradiction very fast. Okay, but I'm not going to dwell on that today. If you want to find out more, look, look, up, look that up online. But when it's between plus or minus infinity and you've got a definite integral like that, certainly you can integrate it, and there's, there's a trick for doing that. So if you let i equal uh, this integral for the first one, and you let i equal this integral for the second one, then we can write i squared as e to the minus x squared times e to the minus y squared. Put the two together, you get i squared is equal to that. Um, then we can basically say, all right, and all we're doing here is it's just a standard, you know, first year university method to put the two together. We're going to integrate from plus or minus infinity over the whole space. Um, but, okay, we could also think of that now as, think, as we're integrating over an entire space, we could think about swapping to polar coordinates. And there's, there, there's a reason for doing that, it'll drop out later on. So we can make x equal r sine theta, y equal, sorry, x equal r cos theta, y equal r sine theta, then r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. The element of area is delta x times delta y. Well, the elements of area in polar coordinates would be r, delta r, and this 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 appearance of the r makes it uh, makes makes all the difference. And we'll see later on we substitute it in. So uh, r delta r delta theta. That's effectively an element of area. Yeah, because uh, thinking back to you know 
thinking back to uh, sector length from your know, A level C2, whatever it is, that R delta theta there is going to be that length, that length is going to be delta R, so an element of area would be that. Okay. So in polar coordinates, if we want to integrate, see here we're going over the entire space. Okay, you've got to think, well, we want to integrate over the entire space here. So R is going to go from 0 to infinity, if you like, and then we're going to rotate right the way around. So you can think about R going from uh, 0 to infinity, then if you go right the way around the entire space, that would again give us the entire space. And here, our delta x delta y is replaced by R delta R delta theta. This is now useful because this combines to something we can integrate. Okay, It's quite easy to see just by considering uh, the reverse of different integrations, the reverse differentiation. We can now see that the integral of this would be this. Now if we differentiate this, we're going to differentiate this as a whole. Okay, and again, this is just an application of the chain rule. If I differentiate that, I get minus 2r, right? Uh, and then that will cancel here. If I differentiate things as a whole, I just get back what I've already got. So you can see that that goes back to that. We have to now evaluate that from uh, infinity to minus infinity. When we put infinity in, it will be 0. When you put 0 in, you get minus a half. So you're stuck with, uh, you're going to get 0 minus minus a half. So you wind up getting that i squared is equal to a half delta theta. Okay, then we're just going to have to integrate. Well, it's easy to integrate a half. You just get theta, substitute in, and you wind up getting a first important result that i, this integral here, if we go right back up, is equal to the square root of pi. All right, stated there. That's very useful. The next one's actually um, a lot easier because you kind of already know that this integral has to be zero, and it's because it's an odd function. Um, if you consider f of x equal to this, then f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. So that basically makes it an odd function. It's like having in the x when you go, well, you're going to go this way, the function goes up, and effectively when you go this way, the function goes down. So that means that the areas must cancel, okay? And that is sufficient to see that. I mean, I've just sketched it here. I've gone through the steps of actually doing the derivatives, but it's equal to zero. You can see now that when x is equal to zero, we get a zero here. It's going to still have to go to, as you go to infinity, it's going to have to taper off to zero, both in the positive and negative direction. So you must have a maximum and minimum either side. I've just differentiated to find you know, where that occurs. So what happens with this graph? It peaks up here, it has a maximum of 1 over root 2, and then tapers off as you go to positive infinity, and uh, similar, but upside down if you like, as you go to negative infinity. Well, Clearly then, okay, if it's an odd function like this, these areas will match, but one will be positive, one will be negative. So that integral has to be zero. So that's probably about the easiest of the bunch to do. So finally, the third one, where we've got i is equal to this. This can be integrated by parts. All you have to do is pick it apart in the right way. It's quite nifty how you do it, actually. You can let u equal x, and then dv by dx equal x e to the minus x squared, just using the fact that, again, this can be integrated. Okay, this can be differentiated. So it all works out quite nicely. So if I differentiate that, clearly I get 1. If I integrate this, I get this. Um, so, and then I can write down my integral, my integration that's been done by parts. Yeah, uh, all we've got to do, uv, which is basically these two. Oh, it's just spotted a little mistake I've made there. So that should have been an x, there should be an x in here. So that should be x uh, minus, so that's got to be that there. It doesn't affect anything, actually, because this term will still go to 0, but there should, in reality, be an x there, because that should be uv there. Apologies for that. So there is an x in there. And then here, we've got minus uh, this term here, which is those two things multiplied together. And we already know what that result is. We know that goes to 0, because this goes to 0. Uh, faster than the x goes to infinity, effectively, because you have got the x there, remember, so it's worth just realising that this will always go to zero, way faster than x will go to infinity. Um, so you're, you're bound to get uh, you're bound to get zero when you go to plus or minus infinity there. So you're left with just this term here. We can take the half out, and again we're left with this, so we wind up getting the root pi for that there. All right. So you, the finally the result then, that the x squared e to the minus x squared delta x is equal to this. Now, uh, can we use these things to work out our a, b, and c? Well, as soon as you got to this point, uh, I mean, the logical substitution here would be to do, okay, so this is my first condition that the, the total area under the curve has to be equal to 1. And all these things are just, that's you know, you always have, for a PDF, you have to have that condition. Okay, so if you're not certain what I'm talking about there, then just some, some basic knowledge about, uh, about probability distribution as well. Be out there. So 
that implies that this back to my function has got to equal 1. So if I let y equal b open brackets x minus c close brackets then I wind up with delta y is equal to b delta x and then I'm going to divide both sides by b. So when I substitute in uh, what happens is well I get an a here that I had before this becomes y, my delta x becomes this I can bring the a and the b outside, I get e to the minus y squared delta y equals 1 I get a all over b root pi is equal to 1 and I wind up with that final equation there. Alright, so the next one then, uh, all the substitutions are going to be fairly simple here, so I've got a condition on a and b, right? Uh, so that's come from doing the, you know, the integral area and the curve has to be equal to 1. So again I need to have this equal to the mean so I'm going to integrate it up, we get this again we're going to do the same substitution, we're going to get delta x is equal to this in we substitute with everything, uh, it's a bit more complicated now because I've got this uh, this uh, you know this x bit here that comes in here which basically just comes from manipulating this around here so uh, if you think about how to isolate the x, we're going to divide through by the b we're going to add on the c and we get that as being x, that becomes x there and all the rest then just pops out, it's a bit more complicated than before. Uh, we have to break this into two parts now, we've got this integral here which conveniently goes to zero which has just come from uh, this bit here effectively, that multiplied by that. We've also got this multiplied by that and we wind up getting this here which is equal to the mean. Um, again we use the fact that that's equal to root pi and what's convenient of course is if you just think back to what we already found, we did find here that a all over b root pi is equal to 1. So if a all over b root pi is equal to 1, that leaves me with the fact that c is equal to the mean, which we already kind of knew anyway, right? So we've got one of our constants. The, the final thing we're going to get now is, okay, we've got a condition for a and b, which we haven't really used other than uh, to just other than for the mean here, and that just, just sort of drops out. Um, so this final thing should give us another equation for a and b, and we should be able to solve those simultaneously to get to uh, the standard standard PDF equation for the normal distribution. So if we recall from C we've got sigma squared is equal to all of this. In we substitute the uh, as before and we I've just so actually it's worth just saying I I've just focused on the integral part here. I'm gonna add subtract the mean at the end so I'm just, just thinking about this bit first. So I get x squared e to the minus b squared da, 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 equals i substitute y is equal to this you get delta y is equal to that and then you wind up getting a over b when you take that out there. Um, and again, I've just here I've just expanded all these brackets. That's y squared multiplied two together, double it. C squared e to the minus y squared delta y. Now we think about each of these terms in turn, if you like. Well, again, if we take the this out, this uh, b squared out here, and just think about um, multiplying that by that, then we're going to get root pi over two. That's exactly the same, apart from the constants which you can think about taking out as the one of the integrals that we did before, we had the f effect we did of x squared, but of course it doesn't matter, we did we've got y squared e to the minus y squared delta y, it's going to be root pi all over 2, right? This will come to 0, we multiply that through by that, and then finally for the last one we're going to get uh, root pi, we multiply that through. So, okay, that's, that's good, it's all sort of falling out again, um, and we should, this should lead us to our final equation. So uh, we're just tidying up a little bit here again uh, from as before. This comes to one, so this nicely leaves me with c squared here. We get a b cubed here, so we get a all over b cubed times root two plus pi minus mu squared. Uh, and then of course I want to actually that's just my first integral. So when I come back here, I've got to remember sigma squared is equal to this integral minus mu squared, which is nice because it gets rid of that mu squared for me. So I've now got sigma squared is a b cubed times root pi all over two. Ah, so now, uh, what did I do here then? I've got to think back. These are my two equations, effectively. I've put the, uh, I've put the this one here, b cubed two there. I uh, got the sigma squared there. Blah blah blah. That was the previous one. So I've got to solve these two simultaneously. Well, uh, easiest thing to do probably, as I've got a b being the subject here, is just to substitute the b in here. So this uh, b has been replaced by a root pi, and we wind up getting effectively a cubed, and b is effectively sorry not b, the pi is to the half so you wind up getting uh, 3 all over 2 there, you know, we're getting 2 sigma squared is equal to a root pi. So if we cancel the root pi on both sides and we cancel the a on both sides, you get a squared uh, will go, so you wind up getting a squared is equal to this and again that's just putting things before. 
This is nice because um, when we square root that, you'll you'll recognise, you know, if you look in all the books, that is what the A should be. And uh, it's very easy to work out what B is now because I'm just going to substitute uh, back for the A. So effectively, all that does, putting the A back in here as this, is the root pi will go on the bottom with the root pi on the top when I put the A from here back into there to find out what B is. And we're getting B is equal to that. Well, remember the formula uses B squared for the actual PDF. So I've got to square this and I get this. And that there is exactly the same as the PDF for the normal distribution that you'll find in uh, books. And I'm sure some book has this derivation as well. I, I never found it. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to do the next video on... Um, Next video will be on basically the bivariant normal distribution and then the multivariant normal distribution. I'm trying to sort of build up an understanding of all three from first principles. So I hope you uh, hope you watch the next one. Thank you. I've also put a link to this PDF at the bottom of the page. So if you actually want to get the document and just go through it, um, you're more than welcome. I'm sorry about the handwriting, but I'm sure you were able to follow things. Thank you. Bye.